Hello. Well, today I kind of want to do something a bit different, and uh, that is mostly to sort of talk about or discuss uh, plot holes in films. Now, obviously plot holes pertain to things happening and, you know, no explanation is given, and, you know, it could be seen as inconsistency with the film. Like, just so, well, this happens, and because that had to happen, uh, and no explanation is given. Um, sometimes uh, plot holes uh, come from, you know, the writing, and sometimes if the writing of a script is not all that great, the film itself may not be all that impressive either. Um, the direction, you know, is not directed by the person who wrote it, they may try to make the best of what they have, and what they have might not be the greatest to begin with. Um, and other times, it's not that case. You know, sometimes it's like, oh, really good movies, you know. But there might be one or two things that seem inconsistent. Um, sometimes it is on a writing level, uh, some, and sometimes it's for editing. Like, sometimes think, scenes get cut or trimmed down, and some information that is needed uh, is eliminated for time and uh, you know it might help with the pacing but perhaps you know it, some scenes are uh, maybe best to be into the film instead of on the cutting room floor sometimes this is done by the filmmaker because of the time you know if he didn't need it at a certain time and you know, that scene kind of went on too long, so let's cut it up a bit. And But then as a result, some piece of information that is needed to help ensure a plot hole never occurs. Now one exists because that scene is now removed. At other times, you know, uh, the studio, like a Hollywood studio, Hollywood has been taught, they, people have talked about uh, this good uh, for many 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 years now uh, some studios take control of a film and they cut it up without the director's approval uh, in any way and as a result sometimes films have plot holes or films just look different from what the uh, director and people involved m making the film envisioned um, Orson Welles uh, famously had his uh, w uh, was removed from the editing and was not allowed into the editing room for uh, the Magnificent Ambersons, and so they reshot the entire ending without his knowledge until seeing the mo seeing the movie or uh, seeing some cut of the movie. I don't know. Uh, he he said that he doesn't really watch his movies after uh, they're done, but. With that film, I think he did see it at some point, and he, that's how he knows the ending was not what he shot. Uh, he was off in Brazil making a documentary, comes back, and he's not in the editing room, or he's not allowed in it anymore, and so he has no clue what they're putting together and what they're removing, and so the end result is, well, not really Orson Welles' vision. Um... So I have a couple of th films here, uh, one of which I've never actually talked about uh, in any grand detail. Might have mentioned it in passing here and there, but I'm not going to get to that right away. The first movie I want to talk about is one I'm not going to spend much time on because I've actually talked about this quite a bit. There's actually a video talking about why it's actually a lot better than what people say and talking about some the plot holes or major issues that people have with the film. So, on that regard, you might say there's no real point in me even mentioning it here, but because I've talked about it, I thought at least Baird mentioned here, uh, at least again. Um, that is The Dark Knight Rises. Um, made a video going through what the big plot holes people say are, and I often keep saying this film is like a uh, coming full circle with the trilogy as a whole. 
This film has many elements from like references from Batman Begins. And so if you've never seen Batman Begins, some of the stuff that happens in this film may be a bit confusing and might might not make much sense at all. Even though you can watch all of these movies individually, it really benefits if you have at one point watched all of them in order. Uh, the Dark Knight's probably the only one that you could watch on its own without ever seeing Batman Begins. Just the way that film is designed from the beginning until the end, that's really it. The only context you might miss is uh, the fact that uh, Scarecrow was the major villain in Batman Begins, and he just has a cameo in The Dark Knight in The Dark Knight Rises. Uh, so there is that. Um, also, something I... Uh, yeah, I... I yeah... There's a detail that I didn't get right, 100% right, but it's one of those details that, while it probably doesn't matter much, it's one of those things that, you know, there's that one person who will probably at some point, if they see that video and watch it all the way through, they might point out something, which is, I said how there was three weeks that Bruce Wayne uh, could get back to Gotham City from wherever he was in the world back to America, like sneak onto a plane and then from there go into Gotham City. He had more than enough time, but it's technically 23 days, so it's three weeks and two days. So for that one person who's going to point that out and make that a big problem at some point in the future, because it's never happened yet, and if you somehow watch this video... There you go. That, that's now solved. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, I've gone through a lot of what people have complained about with this film. I made a big video about it. And uh, I've seen some people say, if you have to defend a film, it was never good to begin with. And I kind of think that's kind of a dumb uh, thing to say. Because, in a way, everybody defends movies. You defend your position why a certain movie is good. Why is this good? Why is this not good? You sort of give examples and in a way, a roundabout way perhaps, you're kind of defending your position as to why this is good or why this is bad. So I don't see me uh, talking about this and explaining how this film has a lot of... Uh, moments echoing back to Batman Begins because it's coming full circle, which I guess nowadays you don't see many franchises do when they come to an end. Um, I mean, it does ha happen still. You know, I'm not saying it never happens anymore, but it doesn't seem to be as frequent when a franchise finally ends that it comes full circle. The Dark Knight trilogy is one that it did that. Uh, Star Wars did that, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit. Um, but yeah, uh, I will definitely give a link above in the description or pin comment or somewhere where you can watch that video of me uh, discussing the various complaints that people have. And they're not every complaint everybody has ever had, because that's kind of impossible, because... It, People, if they have issues with a movie, especially a movie as popular and huge as this film, not everybody is going to have the same problems. But I compiled a lot of the big things I was able to find on the internet. Many are just repeating. They sort of have the same sort of uh, uh, examples, like this doesn't make sense at all, and you can't find a way for it to make sense, and... There actually is ways to make sense of this film. Uh, with the film itself, as well as with the trilogy as a whole. And it's also one of those things where... It's the third film in a trilogy, and those films are often just uh, blind. Or, blind. Blah. I can't even talk, so I'm not even going to attempt to try and say that. Uh, that word anymore. I think you know what I mean. It's just not. It just seems to be a good excuse to now hate on a film. And people not necessarily giving it a real chance. Uh, you know, 
finally, years later, almost a decade now, people are finally giving this film an actual chance, uh, it seems like, which I think it should have happened a lot sooner than it is now, but I guess better late than never. Uh, people are now able to accept this film for what it is, and able to watch it as a trilogy, and I think if people do that, they will not really complain much with uh, The Dark Knight Rises, because I actually wonder how many people saw Batman Begins before The Dark Knight Rises in 2012. I know a lot of people saw The Dark Knight, but some people just, I guess, skipped out entirely on Batman Begins, not thinking that was ever needed to uh, be watched at all. Especially since The Dark Knight, you know, didn't really reference a whole lot uh, to Batman Begins, aside from the whole Bruce and Rachel uh, stuff, you know, and seeing Scarecrow, but even then that's just a cameo, and you're like, ah, hey, it's Killian Murphy, and that could be just how people would see his appearance, you know, and he's Scarecrow, and that's it, but yeah, I guess Batman Begins wasn't really watched a whole lot in for some people so maybe that contributed it. or people who saw Batman Begins I guess maybe didn't expect there to be a full circle in referencing Batman Begins quite a bit I don't know you know Nolan didn't really talk much about this film when it came out but that's because you know why would he he wants people to see his movie uh, so you know there is that this uh, next film is uh, Reservoir Dogs, and you might wonder why I'm even talking about Reservoir Dogs, and uh, good point. Uh, one thing I've seen people talk about is, uh, you know, Joe Cabot coming back, spoiler alert, I guess, spoiler alert to everybody who has never seen Reservoir Dogs. Okay, uh, so to all those who have gone away, or just don't care... You know, at the end of the film, we know Mr. Orange is the cop. He's the cap, the cop in the group. He's getting intel to help take down Joe and the guys. And some people, there's a couple of things, but I want to get rid of the first one off the bat that I wasn't really thinking of talking about, but it somehow popped up that, you know, why couldn't the cops just get Joe on their own? They have to have someone like Mr. Orange be in there. I mean, if they have him getting intel and stuff, isn't that enough? Well, there's not a whole lot they can really do in terms of putting him away for a long time. I mean, yeah, I guess if Mr. Orange were a wire, they would be able to get him on stuff of conspiring to, you know, commit crime or commit robbery uh, but outside of that you know there will be some charges but with how Joe Cabot uh, appears in the film and what we're able to see and hear about him he seems to be a very powerful dude he has a lot of money I'm sure he'd have great lawyers so any lengthy amount of time you could ever any jail time that would be lengthy for charges of that nature would quite possibly be reduced quite a bit. Whereas uh, if he's part of the group, you know, Mr. Orange is part of the group, and takes place with the robbery, and infiltrates and gives him information, and then finally the robbery happens, well then, you know, now there you go. The robbery happened, Joe Cabot shows up, bam, there you go, they're able to move in and take him down. But, uh, you know, some people, that, that's not really a plot hole. I don't see that, but what seems to be a plot hole for a lot of people is Joe Cabot seems to know Mr. Orange is the cop in the group, and then he shows up anyway. And I, and I, in a way, I can kind of see where people come from with that. Uh, you know, make doesn't really make sense that he knows who the cop is. He knows they've been set up. And yet he shows up and then 
you know, what happens in the film, he gets killed. Um, you know, that just doesn't make a lot of sense to many people. Though with how Joe is made up in the film, to me it doesn't seem out of character that he would show up anyway to make sure that the diamonds are there, you know, instead of, you know, having everybody go back to his place or office with the diamonds, and then I guess the cops trailing behind them and then breaking in, that could be seen as something that's like, you need know, like a warrant or something of that nature then. But if they're waiting and they're able to do an operation like this and have somebody in there giving them intel and wait for everything to happen and him arrive, he seems to be the kind of guy who would want to see uh, for himself that the job was done and the diamonds were gotten. You know, and yeah, sure, his son was there. No doubt he trusts his son, but again, he seems like be the kind of character who would really want to see with his own eyes uh, the diamonds, you know, because it just... That just seems to be the character that I get the impression of when I watch this film. And it was never really a thing I thought of until I saw some people pointing it out. Like, why does he do that? Why does he go back when he knows the cop, the who the cop is in their group? He knows he was suspicious of Mr. Orange and was never 100% with him. But he goes back anyway. And also, he seems to be wanted to deal with that situation himself. He wants to be, because he feels like he wasn't 100% on Mr. Orange, and as a result, uh, everything that happened at the jewelry uh, place happened. People died, and so now they're in the situation that they're in. Seems like also he'd want to take care of that, not just you know see the jewels for his own, with his own two eyes. But there's a problem here. I want to take care of it because I'm in a way responsible for this happening, for having a not having a great feeling on this guy. I let him be part of this anyway, and now it's also my fault that this happened, not just this guy because you know, anyway he's a cop, he's doing his job. But I should have done my job and, uh, you know, made sure my instinct was correct. It wasn't really correct. Didn't have a really good gut feeling about it, but here's the situation and he, you know, deals with it himself. That seems to be the kind of character I've often uh, had with Joe anytime I watch this film. Um, so that's a, another plot hole that people often talk about with Reservoir Dogs that... I don't completely agree with, but, you know, but I can kind of see where people get that. But, and maybe I'm seeing the character differently from many others. You know, that could be. Uh, but, regardless if that is a plot hole or not, this is an incredible film. And this is one of my favorite films of all time, too. Um, I actually like this better than Pulp Fiction, which, I guess for a lot of people, that's just a... Big no-no. You know, Pulp Fiction is the greatest Tarantino film of all time. There cannot be anything other, you know, better than Pulp Fiction. I just like this film more. And, you know, one day, you know, I could uh, talk about my uh, thoughts on this film. and I could actually go uh, through the entire directorial uh, efforts of Tarantino. Even talk about some films I've talked about already, like... Uh, talk about them again like a uh, once upon a time in Hollywood for instance um, so there is that um, and now the last one is uh, Star Wars the original episode 4 a new hope now one might wonder what kind of plot hole is here and I guess depending on who you ask it's either a plot hole or it's Something that just should not have happened. It should have been handled better, which is the Death Star. You know, the Death Star 
having the pull, uh, which had the, uh, you know, the torpedoes shot through and then blew up the Death Star. You know, that should not have happened. That should not exist. And, you know, people are praising Rogue One for getting rid of a big plot hole that always existed with the franchise from the beginning. Well, that's not really a plot hole because, well, the, the, the Death Star would have blown up on its own if it, that exhaust port did not exist. You know, there's a lot of energy in that, uh, in, in that battle station. You know, it would overheat if there wasn't a way for that heat to escape from. Also, I'm sure part of the reason why, you know, if they shot, you know, torpedoes down or trying to get down and they don't fly directly at the, uh, 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 the porthole and then fly off, uh, hopefully at the last second instead of just possibly, uh, getting, uh, you know, having just straight going just downward and not veering off anywhere, uh, you know, uh, there's a likely a chance that they were never going to get it in there. Uh, Luke does it because you know, he trusts the Force, and the Force helped guide the torpedoes into the hole, into the porthole, or uh, exhaustion port, whatever you want to call it, or where all the uh, heat and energy that needs to escape from the station to help cool it down or keep it just cool enough to where the warm and temperature is at a level that is not a, a real threat to the entire station at all. Um, and so from that, you know, that makes sense that there would be something that could be exploited a, a design and a plan that uh, the Death Star plans that you know are completely fine yet on the surface, but if you know got into the rebellion's hands, which it does, they're able to look at the schematics and find something they can use to their advantage that can be uh, used to destroy the Death Star, um, which is what happens. And also, I'm sure you know because of all the heat and the stuff exiting through that hole, shooting a torpedo would not make it go down the way it did for Luke. Probably would have just kept going straight and maybe even had a lot of uh, uh, energy blown out of it, that hole that it would have possibly veered the torpedoes elsewhere and not have gone inside. Whereas with the Force, it was, help, it was able to help guide it down in there and uh i hope that makes sense made sense to me in my in my mind and I tried to write that out but didn't seem to make much sense writing it out so hopefully me just verbalizing it like this made sense that that was not a plot hole it was something that for the death star made sense because if that did not exist at all the death star would have blown up Quite possibly, if it didn't blow up uh, a bit beforehand, it probably would have blown up the first time they ever uh, used the Death Star to destroy a planet or something. So, yeah, it's a uh... yeah. That's just something that people often point to as a plot hole, but it really isn't when you think about it. Uh, also, how people think about <laughs> and talk about Star Wars so much, it's interesting how that's never really addressed much. Um, but yeah, those are just some examples of films that I really enjoy that people often say there's plot holes for. Again, I will make sure you're able to see my Dark Knight Rises video where I talk about how it's actually a really good film and there's really no plot holes at all or anything uh, inaccurate with the trilogy. Uh, and if there are, there's nothing, any major that really does a detriment to Dark Knight Rises. It's uh, 
to the trilogy as a whole and to Dark Knight Rises itself. Um, I will most definitely leave such a link in the description or uh, one of those things that can, you can click on that's here. It's probably already passed if that was the case, but you never know. Uh, I could also forget to do that and just put it in the at a pinned comment or somewhere. Anyway, um, just some examples. Um, sometimes plot holes don't really exist in films, but people say they do. Either maybe they didn't pay attention to a certain point of a film, perhaps the film is a bit confusing and so you have to watch it many times before you can pick up on everything. Sometimes some films just are very fast paced and so maybe there is a piece of information that is in the film that is said in the film or shown but because of how fast paced everything is you know it could be missed entirely uh, upon initial viewing and upon multiple viewings you can then see it uh, yeah sometimes with plot holes sometimes they do exist other times they don't I just want to give examples where there really are no plot holes in films where people say there are. Um, there are, uh, but yeah, um, that's all I have to say now. Um, I hope you all all are having a great day. Hope you all have a great weekend, and you'll all have a great week. I'll see you all next time.